Andrew Lamming is the Liberal MP for Bowman in Queensland. He joins us via Skype. And Andrew Lee is the Labor member for Fraser here in the ACT, also the Shadow Assistant Treasurer. Andrew Lamming, can I come to you first? Just exactly what is the government's commitment when it comes to returning the budget to surplus? Well, there's no doubt that is our commitment and it was a very strong promise made before the election. But I think it would be fair to say that uh, there's been considerable um, you know, economic uncertainty and changes, primarily international ones, that have faced Australia. So it's absolutely appropriate that the Treasurer doesn't get painted into a corner on exactly where we'll be one, two or five years from now. The one thing Australians know is uh, you will have a, um, a government committed to reducing the debt and you have a government that will do it better than the Labor alternative. So the Treasurer doesn't want to be painted in the corner, so there is no longer any commitment at all to a timetable to return to surplus? Well, a timetable, just like an athlete, will be to run as hard as you can and jump as high as you can. Uh, we're no longer saying that we're going to be uh, clearing 2.14 metres in the high jump. We're now saying that we're going to jump as high as we can and certainly higher than the alternative, the Labor Party. So absolutely committed to reducing uh, the, the deficits and addressing the Labor debt. But this is now a monumental problem that you can't talk about fixing in months. This is going to be, I think, a decade-long proposition or longer for whoever is in government in Australia. Andrew Lee, your response? Of course, I don't think most economists would regard uh, paying down debt as the number one test for economic management, but it's certainly the test that Tony Abbott and Joe Hockey set themselves from opposition when they said that they'd have the budget in surplus in their first year and in every year after that. They've comprehensively failed to meet their own target. Uh, we're now seeing debt steadily blowing out. Uh, we've got uh, a government which uh, was campaigning uh, on a uh, debt truck, uh, now effectively presenting the Australian people with a debt aircraft carrier and saying, no problem here. Uh, this is a government which uh, has made systematic decisions uh, that have increased the deficit. Uh, they've said no to uh, important sources of revenue. Uh, they've given a billion dollars back to multinationals, uh, money back to people with multi-millions in their super accounts. Uh, and those decisions, along with the nine billion to the Reserve Bank that they didn't ask for, uh, have helped to, uh, to, to blow out the deficit. Uh, OK, let, let's strip the politics out of it if we can. You've, sure. ma you've made the point that they promised that the budget would return to surplus in the first year and every year after. They can't do that. So politically, they're on shaky ground. Accept it. But if the government, in this very difficult global climate with collapsing iron ore prices, if they are able to stabilise the deficit as a percentage of GDP and reduce it over time, economically, that's a good outcome, isn't it? Uh, well, the government's complaining about the fact that iron ore prices are back to where they were in 2008, uh, as though this is uh, some sort of seismic shock that they're confronting. Peter Costello can deal with uh, an Asian financial crisis and the US tech crisis. If Wayne Swan can deal with the Queensland floods and the global financial crisis, surely Joe Hockey can cope with iron ore prices being back to where they were seven years ago. OK, and if he copes with it by stabilising the deficit as a percentage of GDP, that's fine, because to contract the budget would be to put, put, the, um, put the brakes on the economy. Isn't what he's doing economic risk? economically responsible, even if it's politically difficult for the government? Well, I don't think it follows that measures to uh, reduce the deficit harm the economy, Chris. Uh, take Labor's plan to uh, fairly tax multinationals. It raises $7 billion over the course of 10 years. Uh, and my economic judgment is that that wouldn't affect Australia's growth trajectory. Uh, that would be a measure which would return the budget to surplus faster. Uh, unlike Joe Hockey's plan to have a plan on multinational tax, we actually have something that's uh, guided by the OECD, costed by the Parliamentary Budget Office and ready for introduction into the Parliament uh, with Labor's bipartisan support if the government chooses to do it. Andrew Lamming, what's your response to that, the criticism that Joe Hockey is not doing enough to tax multinational companies and to look at other sources of revenue? Well, we're in the early adopters uh, as far as looking at ways to work with other economies. There's a group that was ready to go with, a, uh, with basically a tax database arrangement that meant they could get started immediately. We're in the second group there. Uh, look, obviously, profit shifting is, has always been a complicated area. Britain has gone out alone to some criticism. Um, it, I think Andrew's contribution is very, very valuable. Uh, the OECD tax policy people feel that it isn't something that can be implemented now. 
We have the OECD committed to doing stuff within the next 12 months. So in many cases, we need to stay within the pack as far as international tax avoidance goes. Otherwise, you're at risk of double taxation. And lastly, you know, when it comes to working out if there is you know, unreasonable profit shifting, these uh, decisions by the ATO end up in the court. It's only as strong as our own case will be later this year that determines whether we win and whether we can curb the uh, shifting of profit, uh, profits to, to other economies. But unfortunately, this is a uh, teamwork arrangement between major economies. Otherwise, it would have been done long ago and very easily. OK, if we move on now to the subject of climate change, this is shaping for a big year, as a big year for international action. There's a meeting in Germany in June where countries are expected, including Australia, to give indicative targets where they may go beyond 2020 and that hopefully the ambition is that that will all be locked in at the end of the year in a meeting in Paris. Andrew Lamming, is the direct action policy capable of delivering not just a 5% cut by 2020 but any increased target? Well, that target, 5% by 2020, is actually 13% uh, off 2005 levels, so it's a significant contribution. But I'm not going to presuppose what the decision will be later this year going to Paris. Obviously, it may be direct action, it may be something else. Uh, that will deliver the cuts that we commit to take to Paris. But right now, we are utterly confident because the Labor Party has exactly the same cut target, the 5%. So this is not a poisoned bipartisan debate. This is two sides of politics in Australia with exactly the same target. Sorry, just let me pick up on something you said there. You're saying that direct action may almost be an interim policy, that some other policy may be needed to achieve greater cuts? You might have been hoping I'd say that. Uh, no, Chris, I said that I'm not going to say that direct action is, uh, is, is the future plan. I'm saying it's the current plan and we are developing new targets for later in the year and I don't know what they are. OK. Now, direct action is paid for out of the budget. The budget doesn't have a lot of money in it. If it's costing $2.5 billion to get a 5% cut, what happens if the world agrees to a 15% or a 25% cut by 2020? How much would that cost the budget? Look, the, the decision, discussion has always been around global challenges. It's not about Australia going it alone. I'll tell you what will cost a lot of money is Australia trying to have an economy-wide carbon tax when nobody else has one because we pay the economic cost of shifting effort to other economies who freeload on the fact that we had a carbon tax and they didn't. And that's why it's very interesting today to see criticism from what I refer to as many do-nothing economies who are now asking questions about Australia. I love being questioned about Australia's plans, but let's be honest here, Chris, it's just to finish school holidays up here. The bureaucrats around the world were told to fill in a form and ask a question about every other economy except their own. That's the process that's operating at the moment. There'll be questions of Australia, just as there will be of every other economy. So, Andrew Lee, what happens if the do-nothing economies, as Andrew Lamming describes them, start doing something? What happens to Australia? I don't know which economies Andrew has in mind as do-nothing economies, but uh, on a recent survey of climate change leadership, Chris, uh, Australia was rated dead last. Because we're uh, in the teeth of uh, being the developed country that emits more carbon pollution per person than any other, uh, the only country in the world that scrapped a carbon price. It wasn't an economy-wide carbon price. Andrew is misleading your viewers about that. It covered about 60% of emissions. But it was seeing significant reductions in emissions, about 1% a year uh, as it was in place. After scrapping it, we saw our emissions rise. And at the same time as we're moving to this slush fund to pay polluters, uh, you've got China now with emissions trading pilots covering hundreds of millions of people. Uh, you've got a whole lot of US states now with their individual state-based emissions trading schemes, including California with an emissions trading scheme quite similar in structure to Australia's, and of course California's a larger economy than Australia's. Barack Obama's first preference is for a carbon price because he hasn't been able to get that through Congress. He's gone to uh, other alternatives. Uh, but many European countries are going for carbon prices and they're seeing those emissions reductions. It's reasonable for them to ask the Australian government, how on earth are you guys going to scale up your slush fund for polluters scheme, uh, which may not even get to, uh, to a 5% emissions reduction, let alone the 15 or 25% uh, targets, which are a bipartisan target if there's movement elsewhere in the world. So what happens if, say, at the end of the year the world does move to, say, a 15% reduction target uh, by 2020, let alone what might happen beyond that. Um, 
what does that mean for the political debate and the policy debate in Australia? Well, as they say about uh, economic policy, you, uh, you only know who's swimming naked when the tide goes out. Uh, I think if the uh, tide goes out in Australia, it'll be pretty clear that uh, direct action is uh, the equivalent of, uh, of taking a skinny dip. Uh, it is not an attractive policy by any measure. It's a measure which costs the budget but does so little to address carbon emissions. Uh, that's why serious countries don't take this approach. It's why emissions trading schemes are being pursued by evenly nominally communist China. Uh, it's why John Howard submitted, uh, supported emissions trading. Brendan Nelson supported emissions trading. It's why Malcolm Turnbull supported emissions trading. It's effective, it's efficient, gets you the most reduction at the least cost. So, Andrew Lambing, if, if the rest of the world does move to, to emissions trading, say US, China, whatever, is it then time for the Australian government to revisit its policy that maybe move on from direct action? Well, that is ex precisely the process at the moment. But uh, while Andrew skates around these other economies that have a frisson of a carbon policy, either giving up 99% of their permits for free or charging their citizens less than $1 per year, once you leave the EU, no, there are no economic competitors of Australia, there are no trading partners that are serious yet about this area. I mean, when I say economy's doing nothing, I don't need to go far from... Um, from Russia, Japan, Brazil, Argentina, all of these nations are doing very little. And the US, for all of its states doing a, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there, have shown no commitment. I'm yet to see much coming out of Canada, one of our great trading competitors. The answer to Andrew's question is that he's 90% he's right if every other country gets serious. None of them have. And we weren't going to damage Australia by going out first with an economy-wide carbon tax, which is precisely what that was, and then trying to compensate pensioners, hoping we give them the right amount of money. We all have to act together, and when we do, this challenge will be much easier. A coalition government won't go it alone, and that's very, very clear. So are you saying that these other countries, all those countries you just named, will not be changing their positions over the course of this year? I don't recall saying that, no. I mean, what we're saying is that we need to come to a global agreement. First, that will, will, will depend on scrutiny of current arrangements and the Liberal Party and the Labor Party have identical targets at the moment. And at any time in the last five years, Labor could have upped that 5% if they really cared about climate change. Never forget that. Now we're talking to these economies seriously, eyeballing them. And if everyone moves together, it is way less expensive than it will be for a major export-exposed economy like Australia that basically burns the energy to produce products for the rest of the world to consume. But they tell us that we're the dirty emitter. And that's not quite correct. OK, Andrew Lee, perhaps a final question to you, if Andrew Lamming is, is right. Why doesn't Labor up the ante, as it were? If you believe the rest of the world is moving on climate change, why don't you break the bipartisanship, get ahead of the game, be seen as moving in concert with the rest of the world? Chris, the, the question is not the targets. It's whether you'll actually achieve it. Uh, you know, I can have a, a target to run a marathon in two hours, 20 minutes, but unless I've got my training plan to get there, you wouldn't think that I'm, uh, I'm in any way credible. Uh, and similarly, when we're looking at climate policy, uh, we've got uh, a government which is pursuing uh, an approach which no serious economist thinks will achieve... So, La so Labor will not break the bipartisan. It's, it's willing to criticise the government but not move its own targets. Well, these are reasonable targets, Chris. There's a 5% straight away, 15 to 25% if we see significant action among other, among other countries. I think that's the right position for Australia to be in. But what we need in order to back that up uh, is a training plan. An emissions trading scheme gets you to those, uh, those targets. Direct action doesn't. Uh, the government's refusing to release the results of its first uh, slush fund for polluters round. Uh, the reason for that, I suspect, is that they haven't achieved uh, the sorts of shadow carbon prices that they expected they would get. Uh, they're embarrassed about the results of that, uh, that first round auction. If they're not, then why not be open with the Australian people about how uh, subsidies for polluters is working out so far? OK, Andrew Lamming, a quick response from you. Well, they'll be released shortly. We've only just started that process. Andrew's pretty demanding of us, but uh, we'll do it as quickly as we can. OK. Andrew Lamming, Andrew Lee, thanks for your time today. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Andrew. All the best, gents.